On paper, the idea of accessibility seems to be a great idea. That is, putting most things, both abstract and concrete, within reach of as broad a public as possible. This would apply to virtually everything, entertainment, media, medical care, and education, to name a few. And the frame of mind that one has when promoting the idea of universal access is that improvement will ensue in both the areas being accessed and in the people accessing those new areas, with little to no explanation as to how this happens. After all, how could one deny the possibility of improvement to some poor and impoverished soul or transitioning to another realm? Isn't it a good thing that a series of books, such as A Song of Ice and Fire, got its own TV show? expanding the prospective audience and fan base by millions upon millions? Perhaps, or then again, perhaps not. It is not a question asked often, for rather obvious reasons, but it is one that nonetheless, at least to my mind, ought to be asked. Namely, is making each and every thing under the sun as accessible as possible to as broad a public as possible a good thing? Before proceeding, I do want to make clear that some universal accessibility is likely a good thing. Prior to modern medical care, it was not an uncommon thing, and still is, mind you, in the third world, to see streets filled with lepers and the disease some barely clinging on to life. Such things tend to have a ripple effect and furthermore reflect the overall health of a society, which is to say that too much want or unaddressed need in a society creates irreconcilable disparities that long-term typically end in disaster. A brief look at human history will show you that. I mention this only to get out of the way, so to speak, necessary concessions I would have to make on the idea of accessibility of resources. But beyond this, and I will argue this in the video, the matter of accessibility is not a clear-cut one. And maximizing accessibility, whether in concrete or abstract terms, is not always a good thing. A final point to be made before moving on. I do not think that wheelchair ramps for disabled people are a bad thing, quite the opposite. This is not the type of accessibility I am talking about. Rather, semi-unique or niche areas of society or culture that were remarkable precisely because they were resistant to universal accessibility. So let us begin, lightheartedly or not, with media entertainment or books or wherever else you might want to put it. I began reading George R. R. Martin's series, A Song of Ice and Fire, over 20 years ago in the year 1997, one year after the publication of A Game of Thrones, his first book in the series, and every book thereafter. It was a time largely before the internet, though it did exist, and the book presented fantasy in a different way. Real-world history was drawn upon, such as the 15th century English War of the Roses, a clash of houses, and the conflicts that surrounded them. A healthy dose of realism, where the traditionally celebrated Manichaean formula of light versus dark, and yes, I am speaking to you, Spirit of Tolkien, is rejected, and a setting one could call low fantasy or low magic, meaning that to the extent that there was magic or were mystical elements present, they were hidden, difficult to discern, simply uncommon, which made them all the more mysterious. The detail was astonishing, as was the character interaction, and it made for fecund minds to run wild with imagination in an attempt to envision it all. Yet I and others can fully acknowledge that this sort of genre of fantasy, with all its dynastic conflict, pitiless lack of moralizing, where even principled men pay a price far greater than those less so, the only slight nudging towards something magical, and all the attendant effects and qualities is not for everyone, and more importantly, it was never conceived as such. There are people, many, in fact, far, far more enamored of the works of a J.R.R. Tolkien than Martin, if only because they see the ultimate value of fantasy as a vindication of inner dreams and desires, of the Manichaean model of light and good triumphing over darkness and evil. I will concede that this formula never tires from most people because it taps into some of our most primal instincts of how we want to see the world, rather than how the world actually is. For me, I have to admit it's quite the opposite. It is more relatable, if at the same time less realistic, and all that's fine. Add to this the fact that many people do not like fantasy at all, high or low of any sort, which is also fine. The main claim I shall make here is that each genre, with all its 
particular qualities has its enthusiasts and people who appreciate it specifically because of what it is, and sometimes because of what it is not. The fact that A Song of Ice and Fire was thousands of pages worth of reading kept the broader public away from it, but the appeal to turn it into a TV series rendered the series at least nominally accessible, and within a few episodes, many people had become addicted to the theatrical rendition of a series of novels they had hitherto likely never heard of. Admittedly, with the author's help, the first four seasons were well executed, but soon after worsened with each passing season until the current and final season arrived, and the series had reached the zenith of the scatological. Apart from the obvious lack of author input, one could surmise that trying to turn an as-yet unfinished novel series into a television show that had the broadest possible appeal was a task doomed to failure from the start, because in doing so, the makers would have to take away from what made the books as good as they were and gave them their initial appeal. After all, you can only cram so much into an hour-long episode. What made the books great? Complex plot, multiple perspectives that were drawn out covering many characters, the history, lore, and the inability to perfectly predict what was going to happen. Everything the show is not, but at least untold legions of human beings watch the HBO series and think it is the best thing since sliced pumpernickel bread. In bringing the song of ice and fire to the masses, the particulars that gave the books their flavor and pedigree were lost in translation to an audience so vast that it would have been inconceivable for them to have understood and appreciated the original content of the books. I'm sure money had something to do with it. The same would apply to more niche genres of gaming, typically RPGs that require long hours of investment, reading, and devotion. What can be borne witness to in the past decade has been a move away from complex RPG mechanics to more accessible and easy to understand linear mechanics that can be grasped right at the start. The Elder Scrolls, perhaps most notoriously, has gone down this route in an effort to appeal to the masses and has done so arguably with great success in the form of Skyrim. But the real question is how much of Skyrim is really the Elder Scrolls as it was envisioned. I needn't go into the details of all the major and minor changes that have occurred in the past decade plus. Suffice to say, those who originally enjoyed and appreciated Elder Scrolls can scantily recognize the game as such anymore, with the only possibility being countless hundreds of mods requiring long and laborious installation in an effort to recreate an approximation of the original Elder Scrolls experience. The same can be said for countless IPs in the gaming world, Mass Effect, Dragon Age, Fallout, and virtually the entire mainstream RPG genre. Is the value in such games or other forms of entertainment, such as fantasy novels, to be found in its broad appeal or its niche specialized appeal? Broad appeal by its very nature means dilution of qualities and traits that formerly contributed to obvious differentiation of whatever the thing was in question. To gain broad acceptance, one must necessarily strip away the things that rendered something identifiable as something that could not be conflated with other things and damages the integrity of the unique properties that went into the original thing in the first place. Because after sufficient time has passed, these properties largely cease to exist. One can, for example, call something an RPG by name, but if the product lacks any of the elements traditionally associated with what RPG players and veterans alike understood to be an RPG, then all that remains is an RPG in name only. Likewise, attempting to translate a massive series of novels into a TV series that moves further and further away from the uncompleted structure it is modeled on will result in something that is a song of ice and fire in title only, and that admittedly might be enough for some. But these are, as some might claim, trivial matters. What about more consequential ones, such as education? The United States has striven mightily in the last few decades to make advanced education in the form of university degrees as accessible as possible to as broad a demographic as possible. There are, of course, merit-based scholarships, but these are of limited quantity and by their very nature restrictive. But virtually all comers and takers can finance their education via student debt, 
in the form of high interest loans. This is necessary, it is claimed, in order to receive education, which it is further claimed will grant greater employability and success post-university. And this video really isn't about that aspect of things in education. However, it would be enough to state there are multitudes of European countries with successful societies, both culturally and economically, that do not run the model of debt-based university education for all and still manage to do more than okay. A topic for another time, I think. The issue that arises with mass higher education is very similar to the issues we witness in the entertainment industry. A combination of ideological drives with a natural tendency to uniformize the matter on the whole in an effort to render it as accessible as possible leads to a creature that hardly resembles what it had once been. University work becomes easier. The lecture is more accessible. The quality, where quality is defined as the composite of those elements that differentiate a thing such that it rises above and beyond the things it loosely resembles, attenuates, and we are left with something that is a shadow of its former self. Uniformity breeds degradation. Mass accessibility cannot uphold standards of those things that were erstwhile inaccessible because the very reasons for that inaccessibility were the same reasons those things were unique, different, and in most cases, simply better. Why breed sled dogs, ratters, pointers, and sight hounds when every dog can be a golden retriever? Or so the argument might be translated from those who would argue that universal accessibility in education and a host of many other things is actually a good thing. And the monetary aspect cannot simply be overlooked here. It is undeniably true that mass accessibility as a development concept, whatever the product might be, sells immeasurably better than niche products it only appeal to select groups. Game of Thrones, The Clash of Kings, A Storm of Swords, for Crows, and A Dance with Dragons. Annual sales are $10 million for all those books put together versus $15 million annually for each season of Game of Thrones. On the television, that is. You can do the math. Morrowind, the Elder Scrolls game, had sold by the year 2006 some 990,000 copies. Skyrim, as of 2016, over 30 million copies. And so the song and dance could continue. More than 30 times that Morrowind had sold, which was arguably in its totality the better Elder Scrolls game, if only because of its greater fidelity to the original concept. Even adjusted for the 10-year gap, the difference is substantial. The formless, nigh-indistinguishable gray shapes of mass consumption are undoubtedly more profitable, but only a fool would not make the concession that this accessibility does not come bearing a largely incalculable price. Can the metric of success for everything merely be reduced down to pure profit? Perhaps profit as the sole metric of all we do is not the ultimate measure of the good, or things we esteem to be of quality and the things that matter most to us. Profit is important, but the excessive pursuit of it in the arena of the masses has diluted and destroyed many of the things we held dear in the not-too-distant past, in the form of society and culture. True reform is difficult, if not impossible, once the ball gets rolling. And in some cases, such as those with university education in the United States, reform will not come from within or intention, but rather from sheer unsustainability. Sadly, the same cannot be said for media entertainment save for the slim rays of hope offered to us by Kickstarters, niche undertakings by developers such as Obsidian or Larian Studios, and similar such endeavors. We want wheelchair ramps for disabled people so they can get where they need to go, just as we want buses that take people from A to B. However, what we do not want is for each and every differentiated cultural and historical unit to be turned into every human's experience by diluting them to the point of amorphousness and then calling that a success. Mass appeal and accessibility are traps for simple minds. It has largely been a force for destruction, and other than its profitability, offers little of substance to those who need substance most. Thank you very much for watching. As this channel operates off of the generosity and contributions of its subscribers, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Any and all support is more than appreciated. If you like this video, please like, share, and subscribe. 
And if you enjoy my content, please consider making a donation or becoming a patron. Thanks for watching.